Good morning. Could you please stand and sing with us?
For a couple of weeks now, it's about to open up to the public. So if you are a church member not in the CEP and you want to be in the CEP, uh, you want to say that right now. Uh, the Elizabeth at memorialgreer.com uh, is Elizabeth's email. Um, the United Methodist Women are a very faithful organization in the life of the church. They have uh, their call to prayer, and you see that announcement and when it's coming up in the social <coughs> hall. And also uh, a piano concert by Don Shapke as part of our Wednesday dinner that will be coming back in February. If you open your bulletin, let me point out a couple of things. Um, the youth snow tubing trip is um, gathering a roster. We've got plenty to go. But if you want to go, we need to know it. Uh, make sure that you let uh, Katie know that. And Super Bowl Sunday night. This is important. The adults are not meeting next Sunday night. The youth and the children are meeting on Super Bowl Sunday at 4. Okay? They're one hour earlier to get you home one hour earlier so that volunteers and children and everybody can enjoy the Super Bowl. I thought, what's the big deal, Super Bowl? We, you know, we need to be doing what we're doing. But the um, people on staff were like, the Super Bowl is really important. And I was like, okay. Sounds good enough. Uh, 4 to 5.30 next, sun, next Sunday night. Tonight is normal. And... Um, Confirmation picks up tonight as part of the youth group. And also on Super Bowl Sunday, our youth, as they uh, have done for many years, will have um, pots, uh, soup pots at each door in our worship services um, to collect for the Super Bowl of caring that will go to um, Greer Community Ministries. So please note those things that are coming up, um, uh, really significant things as we are starting off the semester. I have an um, exciting announcement. I'm going to call up Cindy Miller. She's our chair of Staff Parish Relations Committee, which is the HR of any United Methodist Church. We're going to celebrate Erin uh, uh, two weeks from today, um, but she has an announcement uh, after that. As Joe just mentioned a few weeks ago, Erin announced that she would be leaving us. Um, she's to take a position at Lake Conestee. Uh, Nature Park. We're happy for Erin, but that gave us the task to have to find someone for our Director of Children's Ministry. And at this time, I would like to ask Katie Jeter if she would come forward and join me. Uh, I'm happy to announce that Katie has accepted the position of Director of Children's Ministry. <laughs> Katie is a lifelong member of Memorial and actually held this position one time before, but had to leave due to family responsibilities at that time. Erin um, and Katie are going to be working together to ensure a smooth transition for your children and their families, and you're joining a great staff, and I just say welcome. And this time, um, I know who like Dallas Thomas is. I won't ask you who Dallas Thomas is. 
right? I know when things are happening. I know a little bit more than when I started with Katie and I asked her every question of everything in every way, really in text form. Uh, she had to up her text plan because of me. Um, so we're grateful um, for Katie and she, she is currently the infant teacher of the preschool and we, want, we are great partners with the preschool. We wanna give them a solid chance to find a teacher and so children's volunteers um, we're going to lean on you uh, in the coming weeks to make sure that we get that exactly right and get them a chance to get it right. So, um, Katie, welcome. Thank you. Um, let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for being present with us. You go with us as we travel to work, as we travel to school, as we travel to the hospital, and as we travel home in some cases individually, in some cases with members of our family. Today you gather with our church family. And though we may not see each other much during the week, we gather together today as a family to love, to learn, to serve. Help us, Lord, to set aside our thoughts of last week and next week, to focus on your message for us this day. Inspire us, Lord, as we pray the prayer your Son taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So our opening image today is bells and whistles. These things that um, when we see on a commercial, when we see in an advertisement, when we think uh, we see our peers have it, whatever it is, we think, man, that thing is really great. You're telling me it does that? I know it's a little bit more, but it is able to do that. Now, you might not typically think of um, my image for the day in terms of bells and whistles, but I'm going to sell you on it. Let's look at the image for the day. 2004 Dodge Caravan. As soon as we found out we were going to have a second child, we uh, got a caravan. And I thought, and Katie thought, you know, uh, minivan, that's the thing you go through. But we got in that minivan. That's the most comfortable seat in the history of any car that's ever been. I don't care what luxury vehicle you have. The captain seats in a Dodge, 2004 Dodge Caravan. You talk about people that are both driving that car. I'm six foot three. Katie is five foot three. I have a massive head on top of the six foot three that really wants to hit the top of the car. She doesn't. You need a seat that changes dramatically, and no seat on this earth has changed like that seat to completely tailor to who the person is. The only car we've ever had that had separate seats for children that want to be separate from one another on a long car ride, right? The only car we've ever had, and we've missed it ever since it was gone, Stow and Go. Anybody get excited about Stow and Go? I tell you what, since we've lost Stow and Go, I have missed it dearly. You're talking about opening up these massive buckets in the van to put stuff down in there and stacking it up in the back and you can't see it because you got so much space. No car ever has had Stow and Go and the most comfortable driving car I've ever had. Now, at the end, when it was my primary car, I wasn't as excited about it. But when it was our family car, I loved it, loved it, loved it dearly. But with all those bells and whistles, all the things that they offer to families that they put a whole lot of research in, what's the one job? Is it the seats, right? Is it the DVD players on the back of the seats? Is it the stow and go? No, it's, it's, it's got to drive us somewhere. It's got to get us somewhere. You got one job. This thing has got to get us somewhere. And when it could no longer do that one job, it could no longer be part of our family. 
So that one job, that one thing that we're doing is something that I want you to think about when we get kind of complicated thoughts about what this Christian life should be. Matthew 5, verse 1, is the story of Jesus gathering these people in kind of a natural amphitheater of a rising uh, ground up from the Sea of Galilee and just speaking to them. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of thing, evil things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So your first phrase is a walk of faith. Now, I haven't seen this before until I um, read it with a friend this week on the podcast. There's a gradual escalation of what he says for two very different things. It, it goes from getting up to growing up. He says to these people, some of which may have had something to do with religion in their lives before and were hurt, some of which have never had anything to do with religion before, some of which uh, uh, love their synagogue, go faithfully, but they're interested in what this person has to say. He says things to them about uh, painful parts of life apart from religion painful parts of life with religion, painful parts of life that are coming if you take it very seriously, and it's in that order. Poor in spirit. Now, you think, what are the times of year? What are the things that happen at work? What are the things that happen in my family that cause me to be poor in spirit? When I think, oh, I, I don't have it. I don't have it. And sometimes your spouse, your family senses it and they help you and sometimes they sense it and they pile on you. I don't know why they do it, but they do it. Blessed are those who mourn, he says, for they will be comforted. So these two are connected more to life than anything. And if there were anyone who thought before this day, those who are poor in spirit and those who mourn are blessed they would be different. He says in that moment, you're blessed in that moment. You are um, uh, cherished by God in that moment. And people who had a lot of thought about cause and effect, if I'm poor in spirit, if I'm mourning, well, then God must be against me. I must have done something. That, That carries on even till today. He says, to this large group of people, if you mourn, if you, poor, if you are poor in spirit, you still are blessed by God. Now, you think that would have struck a bunch of people? What were they mourning about on that hill? I don't know. It was way back then. I don't know. I didn't know any of them. Okay, well, um, you think they had relatives that were sick? Do you think they had um, obstacles that they didn't think they could overcome? Do you think they had uh, jobs that had no hope? Do you think they were low on money and owed a lot? That's way different than today, right? It's totally different than today. Whatever concerns are right here are the concerns that were right there. But for we got technology and stuff like that. He said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who, are mourn, who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Now, in that crowd, um, you know, the loudest one wins. 
That's different than today, right? That's way different than today. The loudest one who screams whatever they want as long as they want in order to get what they want. Oh yeah, that's right. That's the same as today. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, this is what's different. You read this story in Matthew and Luke. And I think it's important to emphasize which one they emphasized. Luke talked about true physical thirst, true hunger. Matthew talks about hunger for righteousness. Hunger for understanding what God wants. Now, that doesn't mean they know it. He didn't say, blessed are the scholars. Blessed are those who have been in the synagogue 49 times a year for the last 17 years. Blessed are those who already know what God is talking about and don't need any help figuring it out. Blessed are those who have more money than they need, everybody's healthy, and you have meaning and purpose. He doesn't say that. He said, blessed are those who are hungry to understand. And he doesn't put any kind of qualification on any single one of you on this hillside, on this beautiful water, any single one of you who are hearing this in this congregation, who are hungry to understand what it is, blessed are you. And see, that's, to me, that's about getting up. And um, those times that you literally did not want to get up, and those times mentally, spiritually, you thought, I cannot get up from this. I cannot get up from this. So people go years without attending church again because they cannot get up from what something that they said or did, something that someone else said or did to them. So he says, first you've got to get up. But the second section is about growing up in faith. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure of heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Okay, those three you can kind of lump together and you can say, I can look back at this last week at times in which there were conflict, mild or moderate, in person or on a video call or on a phone call, in an email, in a group email with reply alls flying. Was I a peacemaker? Did I sense that someone was broken and reach out to them in a way that I wanted to support them? Or did I pile on them in their brokenness? Blessed are the merciful. You think, now, that person doesn't deserve another chance. That person doesn't deserve my patience. See, those three are really offering something special to anyone that you interact with. Not your absolutely double best friend of the last 27 years, but anyone you interact with, even your crazy cousin. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure of heart. It goes there, and then it goes up a level to what I just said. It goes up another level. Because he's saying to his disciples... He's saying to the people who are present there, if you follow me, the expectations that I will place on you will be gradually elevated. You will have to go to places. It's, it's, you know, it might be easier if we go to a town where people don't know you, but we're starting off, we're going to towns where people do know you. They know where you were last Thursday night. They know what you did when you were 17. They know what you did in that relationship that just was ripped apart. And you are going to be one of the bearers of this message to other people. And you know what they're going to say to you? This guy? Really? This guy? How do we know that we're going to say that to you? How do we know that humans are going to say that to the people he's calling? Jesus' own family did it to him. Jesus' peers did it to him. Jesus' disciples did it to him. Oh, really? That's really what you're going to do? You're the one that's going to deliver this message? And, you know, you sort of had me at, um, you know, get up off your feet. We can do something. You can be something special. 
It was even interesting when it was like, we're going to be peacemakers. We're going to offer mercy. People aren't going to like me. My friends aren't going to like me. My family's not going to like me. I'm going to say something that's going to upset people that you told me to say. And if I'm persecuted, I'm blessed. That doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound right. But that's exactly what he's saying. It's a walk of faith from this point to this point. And then he sort of lays it down to him. It's why I'm giving you the image of the day with the van in um, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. Town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Excuse me. Next phrase is a simple purpose. Um, I can go to all kinds of gurus on how to run churches. We can send our staff to all kinds of continuing ed. We can go to all kinds of other churches and see what they're doing. We can offer all kinds of programs. We can offer all kinds of uh, layouts of the bulletins that you love, that you sort of like, that you really don't like since we've done it. We can do the newsletter in a certain way. We can do the presentation in a certain way. Do the chairs in a certain you want me to keep going? We can do all sorts of stuff. But if I'm not placing scripture in your hands, if we're not placing scripture in children's hands, we're not placing scripture in the hands of the youth, and we're not creating small groups that give you connection in that scripture, none of it matters. It really doesn't. If we're not finding ways to use our resources to help others, doesn't matter. Really doesn't. And um, it took me a lot of trips to continuing ed to learn that. That I'd come back and go, <laughs> and go to the conference and they'd be like, you've been using Arial font? Ugh. Arial font is so 2002. You need to be using Courier New. Oh, you're using PowerPoint? Oh, I guess that's okay. I mean, ProPresenter is, really Pro is really the way to do it. Oh, y'all have a 9 o'clock service? I mean, it's fine. It's fine. Saturday night at 11 a.m., 11 p.m., that's the time to have a service to get people. What, you know, whatever. You go to those conferences and they tell you whatever you're doing is a good 5 to 15 years old and you need to be doing this new thing, and you write it all down, and then you, on the flight home, the drive home, you think, um, uh, you know, worthless. I'm not sure we're doing anything of any value. It's all dated. They rarely, rarely ever say, here's the way you put Scripture in people's hands. Here's the way you get them together in small groups. Here's the way you send them out. Because the income of those people depends upon letting you know that you are falling short of what you're doing, right? A simple purpose. So many things in our life have um, so many options, so many bells and whistles. But if we aren't developing one another in this pattern in the life of the church, in the pattern that I read, poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Grabbing people right there and showing them how to be merciful, to be pure in heart, to be peacemakers, to be okay when they're persecuted, when people insult them, to rejoice and be glad. If we are not taking people here and moving them there, and I'm not, I think it's really significant to point out because it's the life of the church, you don't just move from here to there and then you're done. You know, it cycles back and forth, back and forth. If, if we are not doing that, 
if you don't feel that gravitational pull to do it, then we are salt that is not salty. And what else you need that for? You don't need it for anything else but to be salty. Those people on this hill who may not have ever been included in a significant way are told that they are the light for the community. You figure some of the people who were um, paid to be the light in the community, some people who claimed that they were called to be the light in the community, looked out at that crowd as Jesus was saying it and thought, I don't know about that guy. Do you think the people in the crowd who had never been included thought, oh, he's, he's probably not talking about me. I'm probably not the light of the world. They would see over time. Then he says to these people who may not have ever taken the Old Testament or would have been their scripture seriously, may not have ever taken church or faith community seriously, and also people who have taken it quite seriously and wondering what he's going to say about their original faith. He says what's in verse 17. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So your last phrase is grounded in the love of God. So if you've ever gotten the impression that you didn't have to take on assignment, if you didn't have, wait, we don't have to read the book. We can just read the, um, is it Cliff Notes or Cliff's Notes? Cliff Notes? We can just read the Cliff Notes and I don't have to actually read the book. The, of course, that's, man, that's so dated. Um, I, <laughs> wow. I normally try not to do that. All right. Um, I can just look it up on Wikipedia. How about that one? Is that one more modern? Oh, I can just look it up on Wikipedia. If we get a chance, we can take a shortcut. How hard is it to not take a shortcut? Right? He says, I need you to still look at these Pharisees, these people who have been called to be the light of the world. I need you to understand what they're trying to do if you never have or if you've never wanted to. I need you to understand what this text says which really, honestly, in that moment might be difficult because so many of them were illiterate. He says, I want you to be hungry to understand. I want you to be hungry to understand this word that we've read. Of course, the other part of that is the significance of the writer of the Gospel of Matthew is that he is writing to people who love that text. He's writing to people who have taken their Jewish faith seriously their synagogue time seriously, their path to the temple seriously. And Matthew frames it in a way that he says, Jesus takes that seriously too. So here's what's important. He's, people think, oh, he's establishing something. He is showing that God actually loves us. He's showing that God actually reaches out to us, whereas God didn't do that before. God wasn't reaching out to us before. God wasn't offering us opportunity before. Jesus is now the one that is doing it wrong. Wrong that day, wrong today. Jesus is reestablishing the love of God. Reestablishing the path of God from the people who have struggled to do it. I want you to think about um, uh, Joseph and uh, somewhere in the 30s of Genesis, high 30s, low 40s has a special dream, thinks he's special, tells his brothers, they sell him into slavery. 
Now, what would you think if you were sold into slavery by your own family? You ever think like, man, my family's rude. Man, Thanksgiving is tough. Man, that phone call, I can't believe they did that. Okay, his brothers sold him into slavery. That's pretty harsh. He rises through the ranks based on his abilities. He finds himself in a very unique position where he's advising the Pharaoh. He tells the Pharaoh to stock up on food. The whole region experiences horrific drought and loss of food. Egypt now is the only source of food, and his brothers have to come and reach out to him. They don't even know it when they see him the first time. He was poor in spirit. He was mourning. He was meek. He hungered and thirsted for righteousness. He rose to that position. His brothers come asking for food, and he can squash them like a bug. In that moment, in that time, he's merciful. He's pure in heart. He's a peacemaker. He has been insulted, but he does not return that. Instead, he starts a migration of his people to that nation for food that they so desperately need. Grounded in the love of God is not a new thing with Jesus. It's a thing since there has been a God and human beings. Jesus in this story reestablishes it. So here's your final question. Where are we in this cycle? Now, um, sometimes I'll say I, and I think it's important for you to think, where am I in this cycle? Where do I find myself from A to B? But if you've ever been in a um, small group or support group of any sort, you you get to where people, um, you have to watch people dominating the conversation. People will share, 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 share. This is how I feel. This is where I got. This is what I, you know, over and over again. And then there's um, moderate people, and then there's really quiet people. Everybody in the circle, everybody in our congregation has to be aware of where the others are. Can't just be thinking, this is where I am on this path, right? This is where I'm going. This is where I am. This is what I'm asking of God. And this is where I see you are, you are, you are, you are. This is how I can help you where you are. That's how we can be a faith community that's vital and matters and reestablishes a community founded in the love of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you'll please stand as you're able and join us for our modern affirmation. This is the way we affirm our faith in this worship service. You're welcome to participate or simply listen. See if you hear what we're talking about today. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works and whose will is directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of God fulfilled. We believe in the Holy Spirit as a divine presence in our lives, reminding us always of the truth of Christ, our inspiration and strength in times of joy and sorrow. We believe our faith should be apparent in our words of love and acts of service, that the kingdom of God may be a present reality here on earth. You may be seated. It's now time for our offering, and you can give as the plate goes by. You can give electronically with instructions in your bulletin. If you're new, if you're a guest, it's not our expectation that you give immediately. You can rely on the generosity of our people.
Oh
love of God, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit go with you all. The